Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and welcome back to another video for EVE Online. In today's video, I want to talk to you all about Abyssal Dead Spaces. I'm going to give you all of the information you need to know to understand what these are, how to run them, and basically how to get started with them, right? We're not going to be talking about explicit fits or ships that you can use for this. I've done plenty of other videos showcasing exactly that. We're talking the nitty gritty here. How do you actually get inside an Abyssal Dead Space and why would you want to? What is the loop? you can get, how do you go through the process of entering one of these environments. Now, if you do enjoy this video, please let me know. Hit like, drop a comment down below as well. Both of those really help the channel out. It basically teaches YouTube that my content is worth engaging with, therefore to suggest it to other people. If you want to support me financially, I have both a Patreon page, a PayPal tip jar, and a Redbubble merchandise store, all linked in the description down below. And while you're down there in the description, do be aware that I have both a referral link. You can click on that, earn yourself 1 million free skill points, even on existing accounts. You just need to have not used a referral link before, and I do get a nice little kickback from that as well, so thank you very much. And there's also the Cat Skull Cartel Community Discord. Great way to meet a bunch of people who like playing EVE Online. They'll happily give you some tips and tricks as well and help you with any questions you have in the game. We've got an Abyssal Dead Space section of the Discord as well so that you can talk explicitly about this type of content. If you're interested in joining the Catskull Cartel Corporation in EVE Online as well, that's where you come to make the application. So we'd love to see you there, have a great little chat with you. Anyway, with all of that said and done then, with me here warping through to Jita back from running a couple of Abyssal Dead Spaces for this video and losing a ship, which you'll see later on in this very video, let's jump straight into talking about everything you need to know to get started running Abyssal Dead Spaces. So let's talk about the different types of Abyssal Dead Spaces and how filaments work. Now essentially there are five different flavours, if you like, of Abyssal Dead Space, each of which have their own unique weather effects inside them. And there are also seven different difficulty levels, often referred to as tiers, referencing tier 0 all the way up to tier 6. Now, in order to get into an Abyssal Dead Space, you will need to use Abyssal Filaments, and using these will tear a rift in space that allows you to access a particular type of Abyssal Dead Space. Now, first of all, then, let's talk about the difficulties. The different filaments will open up different difficulties or different tiers of Abyssal Dead Space. Tier 0, the easiest, are opened with Tranquil Filaments. Tech 1 is a Calm Filament, Tech 2 is an Agitated Filament, Tier 3 is a Fierce Filament, and Tier 4 is Raging Filaments, and so on and so forth. Now, as you look at the actual filament icon, you'll also notice that there are these little sort of orange spikes coming off them, and that will tell you what tier that actually is. So a Tranquil, being a tier 0, has no spikes coming off it. A Calm has one spike off it, it's a tier 1. Agitated has two, so it's a tier 2. Fist has three, so it's tier 3. And Raging has four spikes, therefore it's a tier 4 filament. If you ever forget the name, that's the easiest way to just check based on the filaments that you have available. Now, the difficulty can spike quite dramatically between different tiers. And yes, it's very easy to go online and watch a video or read an article or something that says, hey, this ship can run tier sixes. It, <laughs> it's very easy to do that. And you will be absolutely right that that ship can run tier sixes or tier fives or tier fours or whatever. But if it's your first time in an Abyssal Dead Space, it is still worth running some of the lower tiers first of all, even with a much more expensive ship, so that you understand how they work, how to fight the different types of enemies. The only real difference between a T0 and a T6 is the amount of enemies in a room and the amount of loot you get. Whereas you might go into a Triglavian room in a T0 and it has a single solitary Damovic flying around. By the time you hit a tier 1, that same room may have two Damoviks and a Kikimora. By the time you're hitting tier 4 or tier 5, you may have as many as 7 or 8 ships flying around, each of which are doing different effects, like entangling you with webifiers or target painting you, neutralizing you, all that kind of thing. And so as you go up the tiers, you're getting more complex combat scenarios where suddenly kill orders and priorities very much become a thing. So whilst it's easy to kind of go, oh, this ship can do T6s, you really shouldn't jump straight in because the ship can do it, but you as a pilot do not yet have the knowledge and the know-how of how to actually get that ship through that environment. 
Now, in addition to this as well, there are the different weathers that you will find inside Abyssal Dead Spaces. This is where the second part of the filament name comes in, whether you're looking at electrical, firestorm, exotic, gamma, or dark. Those are your five different weather systems. Now, if you do forget which of these does which, it's very easy just to right click, show info, and here on the information page, we can open up this little bit here, Abyssal Environment. In the case of an electrical, it's an electrical storm, and it'll tell you here, this gives you a penalty to your electromagnetic resistance, but a bonus to capacitor recharge. Now, the weather effects are the same, whether it's a tranquil or a fierce or a chaotic or whatever, the weather effects are exactly the same. It's only the actual ships in the room that matter. And in shorthand, an electrical filament has a reduction to electromagnetic resistance, both for you and the ships that you're shooting at, and it gives you that bonus to capacitor. That means you're going to have more capacitor available, therefore you're more likely to be cap stable while running an electrical, but you are going to have lower electromagnetic resistances. That said, so are your opponents. So if you can use, say, Mjolnir missiles or Acolyte drones, they're going to do more damage in an electrical than they would in one of the other types of Abyssal Dead Space. We then have Firestorms, and if we look at the Plasma Firestorm Abyssal Environment effect, this is going to give every ship a bonus to its armor hit points, but a penalty to thermal resistance. Now, the thermal resistance penalty, again, means that thermal weaponry is going to do more damage. So lasers, hybrid turrets, and things like hobgoblins are going to do more damage inside a thermal or a firestorm abyssal dead space. The trouble with this is that bonus to armor HP. That means if you're a shield ship, it's not really going to do much for you, and a lot of the enemies that are in firestorms, or actually in abyssal dead spaces in general, are armor tanked. So having significantly more armor hit points means that firestorms can take longer to clear because more ships in them have more HP. And in some of the rooms where ships deal a lot of combat damage to you, they're going to take longer to kill, so you're going to be taking that damage for a longer period of time. We then have exotic filaments. These have an exotic particle storm in them. As you may have guessed by the sort of running theme here, this gives you a reduction to kinetic resistances. So railguns are still going to do quite nicely in here, and blasters and anything that deals kinetic damage, like scourge missiles, are going to be great in here. It also gives you a bonus to scan resolution. This isn't huge. It does mean that if you're running a drone ship, it's more likely that enemies are going to be able to lock onto your drones that little bit faster and start dealing damage to them, but it also means you're going to lock on faster for whatever that's worth. Ultimately, in my opinion, the Exotic Particle Storm secondary effect, their scan resolution, is much and much. It doesn't really do much in the grand scheme of things, which means exotics are actually really quite straightforward to run. Then we come to Gamma Filaments. Now, the Gamma Ray Afterglow, this is kind of the opposite to the Firestorm. What this is going to do is give a bonus to every ship's shield hit points and a penalty to explosive resistance. So again, the penalty to explosive means that warriors or projectile turrets um, or Nova missiles are going to do more damage overall. And the bonus to shield HP is not as bad as the bonus to armor hit points would be, because there are more armor tanked ships in an Abyssal Dead Space than there are shield tanks. So you're far more likely to come across ships that you still absolutely obliterate their shields, and then you've just got a standard armor tank to get through with the reduction to explosive resistance. You may find that actually you chow through those really quite quickly. Now you might be thinking, okay, what about the dark filaments? Because we've got electrical for electromagnetic, firestorm for thermal, exotic for kinetic, and gamma for explosive. There is no fifth damage type, right? Well, yes, you'd be quite right. A tranquil, well, a dark filament has a dark matter field active in it. This gives a bonus to maximum velocity and a penalty to turret range. It should be noted that is exclusively turret range. It does not affect missiles or drones. Therefore, if you are using a ship that primarily focuses on drones or missiles, you've got no negative for being inside a dark matter field. However, a lot of the ships that you're going to be up against are using turrets, and they will therefore have a shorter range to their turrets. And as an interesting quirk of how Abyssal Dead Spaces work, the ships don't tend to account for that change in ranges, which means you can often find that actually a lot of the enemy ships try to orbit you at an optimal range that isn't accurate for them. So actually you take less damage and you can range things really quite nicely, especially if you're on a missile ship. That said, the bonus to maximum velocity is a bit of a double-edged sword. 
On one hand, it means that any enemy ships in there get a bonus to their maximum velocity as well and can therefore be harder to hit or apply damage to. Therefore, stasis weber fires are going to be incredibly useful in a Dark Abyssal dead space. The other side of this is it's very easy, especially if you're using a ship with a micro warp drive, to end up outside of the arena without even spotting it. Especially if you accidentally find yourself inside one of the white Tetrion clouds, because those things, oh boy, they increase your speed whilst reducing your inertia. So you get a sudden burst of speed. And if you're using something like a micro warp drive, it's very easy, like comically easy to just hit one of those clouds and zoom so far out of the arena that even if you spot it immediately and turn around, you may not make it back in time before the damage from being outside of the arena is simply too much for your ship to handle. I've seen a lot of people lose ships in a dark abyssal dead space to exactly that. Now, when you are inside an Abyssal Dead Space, you're going to be looting out of biocompetitive caches or extraction nodes. Now, extraction nodes only appear in Calm or above. So if you're only running Tranquils, you can ignore extraction nodes. And the primary amount of loot is inside the biocompetitive cache anyway. This means it's often more viable for you to essentially kill all the enemies, loot the biocompetitive cache, and then just completely ignore the extraction nodes because the majority of the loot is just in that biocompetitive cache. If you have time to go for the extraction nodes because they will be spread out around the arena. If, for example, there's a whole ton of enemies and you moving to the extraction nodes, blowing those open and looting them is happening and whilst you're still attacking enemies, then yeah, that can be worthwhile doing. But you'll find a lot of Abyssal Dead Space runners tend to just ignore the extraction nodes for the most part, just loot the biocompetitive caches and then move on. The advantage of this is you get a much faster clear time, therefore you can just chain more Abyssal Dead Spaces together to get more loot. Now, there's a lot of different loot that you can find in Abyssal Dead Spaces. We've already mentioned that there are things like blueprints for a lot of the Triglavian weapons, uh, Triglavian ships and things like that that you can find in Abyssal Dead Spaces. There are different mute adaptive, uh, I forget what they're called now, the different uh, things that allow you to mutate your ship's uh, uh, weapons and ideologies. This is something that I've covered in another video. I'll try to put a link on screen now um, where you can mutate different modules to have different effects and different types different weathers of Abyssal Dead Spaces drop different uh, mute adaptives. So for example, if you are looking for uh, something like a mute adaptive for the for your afterburners or your micro warp drives, those drop out of dark filaments. Whereas if you're looking one for shield boosters, those will come out of the electrical filaments. And I will try and put a link in the description down below as well. They'll take you through to a full list of what which Abyssal Dead Spaces drop which type of mute adaptives. Now, the most important thing, however, and your main income earner from an Abyssal Dead Space is going to be these bits of red loot here. Triglavian Survey Databases. Now, these are 100,000 ISK per unit, and obviously the more difficult, the higher the tier of the Abyssal Dead Space you're running, the more Triglavian Surveys will be in each of the bioadaptive caches and in the extraction nodes. Again, majority of them are in the bioadaptive caches. Now these, you can just sell them at your local market. There's probably a load of players who are willing to buy them at Amar and Jitter and places like that, um, but they will be buying for less than that 100,000 ISK per unit because they're making money by buying them off people who are unaware that they're selling them at a lower amount. They're buying them for a cheaper amount, then shifting them off to the real stations that do it, and then using NPC buy orders. And if you're trying to find a station where you can actually sell all of your Triglavian surveys in one go and sell them for the highest amount, the easiest thing to do is to go to the search box in the top left of your screen, type in Concord, C-O-N-C-O-R-D, and then drop down stations. And that will list where all the Concord stations are. You look for the one that is the fewest jumps away, or the safest route, depending, and you set destination for that. Take those surveys there, and you can sell them to NPC buy orders, which will be for the exact 100,000 ISK per unit, therefore earning you the most amount of ISK possible for those Triglavian survey databases. That is your primary ISK earner when you are inside an Abyssal Dead Space. So, with all of that explained and understood, how do you actually use the filament? 
Now, before we can use a filament to punch a hole in reality, the thing referred to as an abyssal trace that allows you to access an abyssal dead space, we need to bear a few key points in mind first of all. First of which is that you cannot use a filament in a 0.9 or 1.0 security system. You must be in 0.8 or lower. And depending on the security rate of the system, there is an upper limit to the type of trace that can be opened without giving you a suspect flag. This means if you're in a 0.8 system, you can open up T0, T1, T2 or T3 just fine, but a T4, T5 or T6 will give you a suspect flag. In a 0.7 system like the one I'm in, T5 or 6 will give you a suspect flag. In a 0.6, only a T6 will give you a suspect flag, and 0.5 or below, well, you can open up a trace with no worries whatsoever. You're already in fairly risky space, the suspect flag doesn't really do much. The second thing is you're going to want to be in a safe space to do this. When you open up an abyssal trace, anyone can scan that down and they can spot it on D-scan. They can then warp out to it if they're willing to combat probe it down and wait outside that trace for you to finish your run, only to then gank you and steal your loot. As such, you should set up a safe spot. Now, in this particular system, I've not exactly set up a safe spot here because as you can see, my D-scan actually does reach the closest gate. But in this current system, there is nowhere I can go that is further than 14.3 AU from at least one point. So someone is going to be able to see me here no matter what I do. I just have to hope that being in a 0.7 system is enough to deter people from trying to jump me. That said, it may be worth spending a bit of time warping around different systems and finding one that allows you to set up a safe bookmark that is 14.3 minimum away from any point of interest. That means if you're 14 point, if you are 14.4 or further away from everything else, when you open up the abyssal trace, it's incredibly unlikely that people are going to be able to spot you. And here, I'm going to have to move because I've had kill rights dropped on me, and that's just not fun for when you're trying to record a video. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Well, that one's on me, really, isn't it? I was just saying that you needed to be in a better safe than the one I was in, and then I got blown up for my hubris. So, there we are. Well done to that guy for the kill. Anyway, so, assuming you are now in a better safe, like I'm now in, so I'm not going to be so easily spotted in the system, we still have a couple of steps that we need to tick off in order to run an Abyssal Dead Space. First of all is you are going to need to be in a fleet, and in order to do this, the easiest way is to open up your character sheet by clicking on your face, right-clicking your name, and forming fleet with. You'll see that down here in your chat window, it's now opened up a fleet, so huzzah, that is that bit now done. The next step is to actually use the filaments to rip that hole in reality. If you are in a frigate, you will need three filaments. If you're in a destroyer, you'll need two. If you're in a cruiser, you'll only need one. But it should be noted that the loot does get doubled or tripled if you're in a destroyer or a frigate, respectively. So the more filaments you use, the more loot you can get out of it, which is why people do run lower tier abyssal dead spaces in frigates. You get a good amount of loot out of them. Anyway, once you're in space, in a nice safe spot. Once you are in a fleet with yourself, you can right click the filament in your cargo hold. And if I go use exotic filament here, you'll see it brings me to this screen. With this, we have a drop down menu that allows us to choose what type of ship we are in. I'm in a frigate, so I'm going to activate a frigate one. Now you'll see we have activate for fleet and it is lit up. Whereas if I was in destroyer, it's still grayed out. So we can go into frigate and we can activate. Now, having activated the filament, you'll get this beautiful little graphic, and there is your abyssal trace in space. Now, if you have a look through your overview, it may take you a little bit of time to find where your abyssal trace is in your overview settings. If you haven't got it on the particular bit you're in, you can right click on the trace and then add it to the, if you can get the right point on it, you can add it to your overview, or you can go into your overview settings and add it that way. Mine's already on here, so it's harder to do. Once this is done, finally, we can right click this and we can enter the Abyssal Dead Space by going on Activate Gate. This will give you one final warning where it tells you again, you've got 20 minutes of time to get through all of this. It's a tier one, relatively calm environment. It's an exotic filament, which tells us what we need to run. 20 minutes, and if it collapses, it will destroy both your ship and your capsule. Once you're ready, once you're comfortable that you're good to go, we're going to hit activate, and we'll get that wonderful little graphic of jumping into the Abyssal Dead Space, and the combat will begin. 
Now I'm going to showcase this one with the worm right now, just to give you a brief basic understanding of what's going on. I'm going to go into my combat overview and you'll see here we have our two extraction nodes, as I previously mentioned, and the biocombative cache. Now, the biocompetitive cache is our loot, so that's what we're going to be going for. You don't have to fly straight at it. Different ships will fly in different ways, but it's worth just noting where that is because we're going to want to know where the gate is, we're going to want to know where our loot is, and we're going to want to know if there's anything else in here because there are sometimes towers that do some really quite powerful effects as well. Now, in this particular instance, I want to be fighting off that Kikimura nice and quickly, so that's going to be my first target. I'm going to send my drones off after it, and I'm going to start shooting at it with my missiles as well. And because of the effect of the, of the abyssal we're in, again, this has reduced kinetic damage. You can see it's yellow boxing my drones there, the Damovic. I should probably pull my drones back, but I'm also fairly comfortable knowing that the Worms drones will handle that quite comfortably. So there it goes, down we go. Those drones then move on to the striking Damovic, and I'm going to shoot that as well. I should be nice and close to the biocompetitive cache at this point in time, so I can just orbit this and not worry too much about things. And that Damovic is going to go down nice and quickly. And it's worth noting as well, these are absolutely beautiful environments. Like there we are, this is one of the towers that I was talking about here. We can see what these are, they do all kinds of different things um, depending on the environment you're in. So here, this is a short range, multi-body tracking pylon. That means anything within range of it is going to get a bonus to any turrets that it has. Um, therefore, if you really want to be able to hit smaller, faster moving targets, flying into range of that will give you better turret tracking. There are also deviant automata suppressions um, that we'll talk about later on if we get one of those, but essentially those harm missiles, they harm drones, and they harm um, drone, rogue drone frigates. Anyway, there we are. I've destroyed that biocompetitive cache. I've looted the materials. Now we're going to move towards the transfer conduit as if it were a gate, uh, a stargate. So I'm going to drift towards that, and this will take us into our second room. You'll notice while the number of lines on the gate denotes which room you are now leaving. So we're leaving room one because we've only got one line on this. Off we go into our second room and look at those daily challenges. Nice filling some of those out as well. Now, the next room, again, we've got a biocompetitive cache. Of course, we do. We always have a biocompetitive cache. That is an absolute given. We've also got, oh, it's another Triglavian room. That's a little bit disappointing, kind of bland to showcase this. But if you're watching my other videos on Abyssal Dead Spaces, I tend to showcase a little bit better than we've got here just to show the different types of rooms that you might end up getting. Anyway, we're going to shoot that Kikimora down again because Kikimoras are absolutely cancer in these. We want to kill those off as quickly as we can. I'm also just going to right click and stack all over here just to keep that nice and neat and tidy. And we're also going to lock onto the biocognitive cache. That Kikimora is going down nice and quickly. The Damovic's about to start shooting at my drones. Um, so I'm going to start shooting that, let my drones finish off the Kiki. There we are, down it goes. Boom! Lovely red Triglavian explosion. Let's follow the Damovic. There we are. Now that orange cloud that you can see in the distance as well, let's actually navigate towards this because there are three cloud types in Abyssal Dead Spaces as well that can be worth talking about. Now, obviously, sometimes you're going to want to fly into these, sometimes you're going to want to avoid them like the plague. I've already briefly talked about the white ones. The white ones um, essentially increase your speed whilst also uh, reducing your inertia, so you get a massive speed boost and that can cause you to rocket around the arena quite quickly. There's also a blue one that makes your signature radius even bigger, um, and this does work for enemy ships as well. So if you're struggling to hit an enemy ship, you can just launch uh, into one of those and hopefully make the signature radius just that little bit bigger uh, to be able to hit them. But be aware that if you're flying through it, your signature radius is also going to be bigger, and you'll know when you're in one of these because you'll get a little icon here on your HUD. The icon here, by the way, is the type of Abyssal Dead Space you're already in, just to give you an idea and a reminder reminder of what you've got. So here, because I'm in an exotic filament, it's an exotic particle storm, giving us a 50% reduction to kinetic resistance and a 50% scan resolution bonus. Now that I'm in the orange cloud here, though, we can mouse over this. This is a filament cloud. It's a 40% penalty to shield booster shield bonus, but a 40% increase to shield booster duration. That means if I shield boost in there, it's going to go fast, um, but it's also going to massively uh, you can see my shield booster cycling here. It's going to nuke my capacitor quite quickly. 
Now this orange line, that is the edge of the arena. And you'll see that as soon as I go out of that, I start taking damage. And the amount of damage you take is based on your distance from that wall. So if like there, you just happen to dip out of it slightly, you can come back in and hopefully not take too much damage, but you'll see it's still more damage than my shield booster can keep up with. There we go. Let's come back inside because I don't really want to showcase um, me losing a ship if I can help it. Now, at this point, you might decide, again, the room is fairly clear. You might want to go around and get the, uh, those additional uh, nodes. In fact, I didn't get the biocompetitive cash, did I? Um, so I still need to go and grab that because otherwise there's no point running this. Let's boost my shields up a little bit. There you can see me in the cloud at the moment. Fast shield boosting, but the fact that it's faster shield boosting, but a reduction to the amount means your each cycle actually boosts the same amount as you know your total overall shield HP per second is still the same as it would have been otherwise. It just means that you're cycling a lot faster and therefore chewing your capacitor like you wouldn't believe. Anyway. <sighs> a little bit far away, a little bit further than I would have liked. This is where a micro warp drive can come in handy. But let's just blast that by a cache, get our loot. We're going to ignore the extraction because it's all the way over there. It's a long way out. Probably not worth the time it's going to take to fly over there and grab that. I can just grab, uh, you know, the all the biocompetitive loot, um, come out and then just run more abyssals. That's the way I tend to look at that. I know a lot of abyssal dead space runners have that same kind of feeling about things. Now, again, loot all. You can either click the loot all or as I'll showcase now, once you're in range and it changes, you can just hit the return key or enter and that will also loot all as well. A little bit of a faster way of doing it. I tend to still use the mouse because my keyboard's doing other things. Um, and I'm happy just to click on stuff. But now, again, we're coming to here. You see two lines this time around the edges because we're going now from room two onwards. Here we go into the third and final room. I did pull my drones back. Good. I had a brief heart attack moment there that I'd left my drones behind. We're now going to go after the biocompetitive cache. Ah, and this time we have, again, this is a load of the Tessellas. These are rogue drones. Now, when you're fighting these guys, there's a lot of them in this room, right? You can sit here and go, ah, it's a lot of enemies. Well, it's th four compared to us normally only having uh, like one or two in the other rooms. So, oh, and we've got Damovics in here as well. Essentially, you can, um, if you have an automata suppressor in the room, fly close to that and it will harm the Tessellas. Be aware it will also harm your own drones. And if you're using missiles, it may also uh, destroy your missiles in space before they hit their targets, which is worth paying attention to. But obviously if you are um, using, um, if you are using say turrets, not missiles, and you don't have drones to worry about, it can very much be worth flying off um, near to a suppressor, a deviant automata suppressor, and just letting that kill the Tessellas. This is what I say about like Abyssal Dead Spaces, you should never just jump in with a ship that can, in inverted commas, do top tier Abyssals. It's worth running some of the lower tier ones just until you can look at one of those clouds and immediately remember what it does. You can look at the weather effects, the different towers, and know exactly what those do. And every enemy that you've come across, you know what that does. What's the difference between a spark needle to seller and a strike needle to seller, for example? Well, I'll leave that for you to figure out. But also, what's the difference between, like, uh, you know, the different types of Damavik that you might find? If you've got a room with Damaviks and Kikimoras, which should die first? How do you deal with a Devoted Knight compared to something like a Photic Abyssal Overmind? These are the kind of questions you are going to need to know the answer to before you can run the higher tier Abyssal Dead Spaces. Otherwise, all you're going to do is create an expensive kill mail. Here we are now, final room. You can see it's a very different looking gate there. We're now done. We can now head back to that transfer conduit and this will take us out of the Abyssal. And it's at this point I'm hoping that no one has somehow managed to scan down my Abyssal Trace. It's entirely possible that as I jump out, because I'm in fairly high traffic system, that there are going to be people waiting for me. So don't just fly towards this and go and put the kettle on. You are coming back into a potentially deadly scenario. So I'm going to go straight to travel and I'm going to have a warp point set. We're just going to go straight to one of the stations, doesn't actually matter which. 
You do have a brief moment of invulnerability um, when you first come out, just be aware of that. But otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna warp off to one of these stations, dock up and enjoy the fact that how much have I just made? We've got a load of filaments there. Um, plus we've got a Maison Exotic Plasma S blueprint and 33 Triclavian Survey blueprints, zero point condensate. That's 4.4 million already from one run. That's not including how much this could theoretically sell for on the market because it's a blueprint. Those don't get detailed. Anyway, folks, that should be everything you need to know to get started running Abyssal Dead Spaces. If you enjoy this kind of content, do make sure to check out my Abyssal Dead Spaces uh, playlist here on YouTube. You can either find that, it'll be linked at the end of the video, it'll be one of the little cards that pops up at the end of the credit section, plus you, I'll have a link to it in the description down below, or you can just head to my YouTube channel directly, youtube.com forward slash at Captain Benzie, and one of the playlists you'll see on that page is the Abyssal Dead Spaces one. You can look for all the different types of ships that I've suggested, how to run those, different kind of content that they can do, just to give you an idea of different ships and how to fly these Abyssal Dead Spaces. Again, always start lower. Just because the worm can do T1s, take it through a load of T0s first, just to get a feel for how this combat, this content works, then bring it up to the T1s. If you've got a ship like a Vagabond that you know can run T4s or T5s, again, take it through lower tiers first to put it through its paces. It's also worth noting a lot of the fits that people link, they don't necessarily mention that they're also running implants and using boosters and drugs and things like that as well in order to get the most out of their runs. You know, squeezing those final bit of their DPS and tank out of their ships. Anyway, folks, that's everything for today. Please do drop a comment down below and a like on the video if you found this useful. Subscribe for more content like it. Come join the Catskull Academy Discord in the description down below. Check out my referral link as well if you want to get yourself 1 million free skill points. And finally, if you do want to support the channel in a financial way, I've got my PayPal tip jar, Patreon page where you can pledge to support and get your name in the credits like the folks you're about to see in just a moment. And I've even got a Redbubble merchandise store if you fancy grabbing some Captain Benzi loot. All that said and done, thanks for watching folks, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!